Good evening and welcome to Comedy Unplayed. Please welcome your host, Brett Blair. Oh my lord! G'day, legends! Oh my god, I'm excited to be here, I'm pumped up. Uh, my name's Brett Blake, I'm your MC for this evening. It's my job to bring on all these amazing, incredible acts. Give a massive round of applause there at the back. You can feel the energy. It's electric, I love it, right? I, um, but I'll tell you a bit about myself. I, uh, I, this sounds, I'm from Perth, as you can probably already tell, right? And I've, I've never seen snow before. Has anyone here never seen snow before? Give us a cheer. Oh man, and I was excited to see snow, by the way. How, what a magical... What a magical star. I was excited to see snow, right? I wanted to go see snow for the first time. Like, I've never seen snow. Like, I've been on ice, but I've never seen snow. Like, they're different, you know? One of them, your girlfriend leaves you. Whatever. She'll be back, maybe. Anyway, uh, I can't confirm that, right? But I, um, I went snowboarding for the first time. And uh, snowboarders... Snowboarders in Australia are different to snowboarders around the rest of the globe, right? Because snowboarders in Australia are exactly the same as skateboarders if skateboarders had trust funds. <laughs> like, they both say gnarly, but after they do that, their dad cripples your dad's small business, you know? <laughs> There's a lot of fucking Audis up on that mountain. A lot of Rolexes flapping around in the wind. A lot of dudes on Bluetooth headset like, yeah, the, the NASDAQ. <laughs> I don't know what the NASDAQ is. Anyway, um, I assume it's important, right? But I, I, went on a, I, went, I went snowboarding for the first time and I went on a beginner's course, right? And no one tells you fuck all about snowboarding when you get there, right? So I got on this beginner's course and the lady gave me a, a snowboard. She attached it to one of my feet, right? And then she sent me up on, you know that chairlift gondola thing that goes all the way to the top? Right? No one tells you that that thing, it doesn't fucking stop. <laughs> right? So I got to the top. I was like, pump the brakes, brother! <laughs> and the lady's like, jump! Jump! And, and I'm like, I jumped. And I ate shit straight away. <laughs> right? Two chairs hit me in the back of the head. Then the lady hit the brake. I was like, oh, there is a brake, is there? Mm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Weird how blood has changed this equation, um, right? But the best part was, right, I was all pretzeled on the ground, all like, all mucked up, you know, right? And then the 13-year-old girl who was operating the lift, <laughs> just in front of everyone, comes up to me on the ground and just goes, sick trick, brother. <laughs> I was like, shut up, you little bitch. <laughs> I didn't say that. Her dad was probably the CEO of the mountain, so... <laughs> You gotta be careful, right? But I was on this beginner's course, and there's two other people on this course. Obviously, there's the instructor. Uh, all instructors are the same bloke to me. They look like they're halfway between doing a shot of Jaeger and trying to root your sister, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't even have a sister, but if I did, I reckon that bloke would find her. <laughs> Cheaper than ancestry.com, you know? It's like, go on, you scallywag, get out there, give her your number and mine. Um, right, and. Uh, now, the first guy on the course, right, he had a, it was a beginner's course, he had a GoPro. He had a GoPro camera on his helmet on a beginner's course. <laughs> it's like, can't, what footage do you think you're going to get here? <laughs> Just you eating shit for 12 hours straight? All you're doing is creating a bullying highlights package for your mates when you get home. It's like, yeah, boys, gather around, gather around, yeah, that's where I ate shit here. Yeah, I ate shit here again. Um, yeah, that's me pissing in the forest. Unfortunately, the fisheye lens has picked up my micro penis. That is a nightmare. Right? And then, now the last guy on the course. Now, I don't like to bring up people's body shapes or sizes because it's irrelevant. But for the purpose of this yarn, it is. <laughs> Due to physics, right? So, if you were to see this bloke at a pub, you'd probably just call him Big Fella. There you go. Work the rest out, right? So, it was me, GoPro fuckwit and big fella. Right, we're all standing on top of this mountain, right? And the guy's trying to root my sister who doesn't exist. Was trying to explain to us, like, this is a stop position here, 
Right, this is a stop position here, and eventually we're going to move into the go position. But don't move into the go position just yet, because I haven't showed you how to wipe off speed. Right? But big fella, big fella, he didn't hear that. And he moved into the go position, and due to physics, he started fucking going. Like, he started going so hard and so fast down this mountain. I was like, brother, I hope you got this GoPro going. This is going to be some sick footage. He is zooming down the mountain. I was like, he's never snowboarded before. Surely he's going to fucking stack it. Nah, he joins the main course with all this 1080 snowboarding Rolex wearing fucks doing this right. He zooms past him because he doesn't know how to wipe off speed. I was like, there's a car park coming up. Surely the car park is going to slow him down. Nah, he goes into the car park. Out of the other side of the car park. <laughs> and then we just don't see him again for the rest of the day. <laughs> and the instructor turns to us and goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nah, we lose one every lesson. <laughs> it's like, give us a heads up, champ. Also, thank fuck this isn't skydiving. <laughs> Guys, are you ready for a big night of comedy? Come on. Come on, come on, come on! Let's raise that room and give it up to the one and only Tom Bella! <laughs> Hello, Melbourne! Comedy up late! I'd like to tell you about my boyfriend. I've been loving my boyfriend very much. We've been together for three years now. He's fantastic. He's probably the most homophobic person in my life. <laughs> Which is a bit weird. I don't know if you've been called a faggot by the guy who sucks your dick, but it really throws you. Guys, he's allowed. It's okay. Relax. <laughs> it's a funny bit that'll do. We'll be having a sincere moment. I'll be looking at his eyes going, I love you, man. You're the best, best thing that's ever happened to me. And then he just pause and go, gay. And it gets me every fucking time. As a queer man, I'm offended. As a comedian, I'm delighted. <laughs> He'll say crook shit all the time. The other day, we talked about what our wedding might look like if we ever got married. And my boyfriend generally said that at our wedding, he wants me and him to face off in a gladiator-style fight and direct quote, whoever loses is the woman. What the fuck? <laughs> Am I dating my high school bully? What the fuck is this shit? He's recently started calling me big fella. Don't like that. <laughs> Here he is, fucking big fella. I'm good at snowboarding. <laughs> we, uh, we really should have coordinated the material. Like. <laughs> He's also nicknamed my penis Cheryl. <laughs> Couldn't you call the penis big fella? That would be better for me. He said, no big fella, I can't. And sure, Cheryl can hear you. <laughs> my boyfriend is a 25 year old professional circus acrobat. Good night everybody, that's it. That's my whole set. That's why I came here. I just wanna let everyone know that I'm fucking a 25 year old circus acrobat. 25-year-old circus acrobat who is not attracted to muscly men. What's that, babe? If I get more muscly, you'll find me less attractive. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Love is about sacrifice. I'm sure he said that at one point. I'm sure that he said that he was not attracted to muscly men. I thought that was very funny. I was telling everyone. One day we're hanging out with some friends and I said, hey, check it out. Old mate here, not attracted to muscly men. <laughs> <laughs> and my boyfriend said, well, I wouldn't want to date the muscly guy because I'd find that a bit intimidating. <laughs> yeah, that's different, okay? That's different to what I had up here. I thought he thought this was hot sexual candy. No, no, this just makes him feel better. I'm an emotional support animal for this motherfucker. I'll pop it away. <laughs> the immediate reaction you get from anyone when you tell them that you're dating an acrobat is, ooh. <laughs> You must be pretty flexible. <laughs> People just assume we're having crazy, freaky circus sex, right? Like he's doing backflips onto my dick and juggling my balls. We're sucking off the Ringling Brothers. I'm getting eaten out by an elephant. None of that is happening, okay? We're just having nice, normal, boring, gay anal sex. <laughs> classic, vanilla, Christian, gay anal sex, okay? That's what we're having. It's just missionary anal, okay, guys? Okay, one time he had a threesome with a bearded lady, but come on! 
one! Cirque du Soleil was in town! Come on guys, it's a late show, get excited! <laughs> I think that's a weird, horny assumption to make about someone's sex life, just based on the profession of someone's partner. Like, oh, oh, you're dating an accountant. Did he order your pussy? <laughs> What's that? You're dating a teacher? Did she smack the little bum bum when you naughty? <laughs> What's that? You're dating a cop? Did he beat you and use racial slurs? <laughs> oh, go easy on the cops, Tom, come on! I've never done anything wrong. <laughs> They weren't protecting those Nazis at all! <laughs> He's a real sweetheart, my boyfriend. He does sweet things for me. In November last year, my boyfriend told me that he was planning on surprising me for my birthday by taking me horseback trail riding. Now, I love horses. I used to go horseback trail riding as a kid. I love black beauty. I had an imaginary horse that I used to play with in our backyard named Sapphire. Gay. <laughs> and... <laughs> it's a very sweet idea for my boyfriend. But we didn't get to go horseback trail riding, my friends, because my boyfriend made a few inquiries, and apparently the horseback trail riding establishment in question have a rider weight limit policy, and apparently this was unacceptable. 120 kilos, officially too fat for a fucking horse. So, is this on? Can you hear me? Hello? Do you guys know fucking horses? I've always wanted the impression, horses, pretty fucking sturdy animals. Horses work out, they're jacked, they're ripped. Every day's a leg day for a horse. They've got those horse cum gutters, the stallions built off at a core strength, carrying around those big horse sticks. That, hello, too fat for a fucking horse. For centuries, horses have been drawing carriages, carrying around knights in shining armor. We literally measure shit in fucking horsepower, but apparently these soy boy beta ponies down at friendly Sam Seaside trail rides, these fucking Shetland cucks, these fucking glue factory rejects, heard they might be lugging my fat ass around. They went to HR, that's horses resources, and they said, no, we can't do it. It's an OH&S nightmare. I was fucking furious. I called them up. I said, get me a fucking Clydesdale or something. Come on! What are the horses gonna do? They're not in the union. Just tell them to lift with their knees. Don't argue with me, bitch. I am riding a horse. I'm gonna go riding on those horses. That's the way it's gonna be, little darling. Come on! <laughs> Did this gig a few nights ago, and a woman came up to me afterwards. She said, oh, if you're interested, there's a place in Dandenong that does plus-size horse riding. <laughs> and I can get you a discount if you want. I said, thank you so much, I'd rather kill myself. You got a great night ahead of you, thanks everybody, good night. Next up, please put your hands together for the sensational Blue Blood! Hello, hello everyone, it's so good to see you. Um, I've been thinking a lot about friendship recently. Friendship, it's meant to be the thing that makes your life better, right? But for me, it's just been very hard and difficult to maintain. And, like, I, I know, like, I was never the popular girl in school. I was never that hot girl. You know, the girl that kind of, like, marched to the beat of her own drum. Like, everyone wanted to do what she was doing. Everyone wanted to wear what she was wearing. Everyone wanted to say what she was saying, you know? She marched to that beat of her own drum, but the beat of her drum was the BPM that makes house music people go absolutely feral. Like, she had it. Like, did your school have that girl? No. <laughs> if your answer is no, then you were that girl. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm thrilled that you came. <laughs> what a treat. I, I was never that girl. And I used to think it was good, actually. I used to think it was better. Because I thought that it meant that I'd spent my time in high school like doing something more important. I'd spent my time building a personality. <laughs> in hindsight... I should have focused on getting hot. <laughs> you can spend all that time building a personality and it can still be absolute shit. Ah! <laughs> Hate that. And, and I've always been a difficult person, I know that. Like, I was a picky eater growing up. You know, I wouldn't eat every, anything. It was the bane of my parents' existence. My mum should try and bargain with me every morning just to get me to eat some breakfast. Yeah, she'd say things like, if you don't eat your crusts, then your hair won't get curly. Someone got her. <laughs> and even as a kid, right, I was like, so what? 
Those crusts can piss off. I'll have straight hair. Bring something better to the table, Mum. Maybe we can renegotiate here. <laughs> but I didn't know at the time that mums, they mean every word they say. And she wasn't talking about the hair on my head. <laughs> Which is how I ended up 30 years old with dead straight pubes <laughs> for the rest of my life. I would never have taken that deal, Mum. Do you know what it feels like to rush home from school? You rip open a dolly sealed section, you see an article that says the bush is back and you're like, what's a bush? I'm rocking more of a native grassland situation. <laughs> <laughs> When's that gonna be in? <laughs> oh. It takes me so long to get ready for bed every night because I've got to put my pubes into teeny tiny little hot rollers. <laughs> just to fake it till you make it approach. It, it looks like just my vagina is auditioning for Annie. <laughs> Thank you. Dying at red was a personal choice. <laughs> but I think it makes the curls pop. <laughs> and if you're going to work hard on them, you want people to respect them. <laughs> And I have always been difficult and I know I'm part of the problem when it comes to friendship. Like I break up with friends all the time. I broke up with a friend recently because she told me she'd been having a really long and involved affair with our married boss at work. I know. And she told me this after the affair had already ended and she wanted to be consoled about it. And I morally, I just couldn't condone Someone withholding gossip like that. <laughs> Spill the tea, bring me on the journey. Oh, if I'm there for the fun beginning, yeah, I'll do a bit of clean up at the end, but you don't get the emotional labor for free. Oh. Instead, now you're dead to me. <laughs> and I'm friends with his wife. <laughs> yeah. And we've got dirt on you. <laughs> Dangerous game. And, and, and because I found friendship so difficult, I focused on something better. I'm just going all acquaintances. It's so much easier, you know? Ob no obligation, no expectation, just the fun times. You know, and I've built a beautiful network in my life of acquaintances. I love seeing my barista every morning, talking about who's the worst customer. I love catching my mechanic once a year, hearing how much I've dented my car since the last time. I love seeing my doctor, you know, once a quarter and hearing about her weird rockabilly niche world that she lives in and what's happening there. And, and acquaintances are so great. And you might be thinking, Prue, all of those people, they're paid to be nice to you. <laughs> but the best acquaintance you can have is someone that you only meet once in your life and that's a drunk girl in a club bathroom. <laughs> You've met her? Like, when, when I was going clubbing all the time, I'd always wear this one little Zimmerman jumpsuit that had long sleeves and shorts all in one. Yeah, they're great. But when I got too drunk to do a pull to the side wee, I would have to take the whole thing off every time I went to the bathroom. And at some point in doing that, I would end up dunking one or both <laughs> sleeves into the toilet. And then I have to spend the next 20 minutes of my night with my hand out underneath the hand dryer, hoping I could carry on with my evening. Someone asked me the other day, did you rinse it? Never occurred to me. <laughs> I wish, I wish I thought to rinse it. But at some point during that process, a drunk girl that I'd never met before would bust her way into the bathroom like, boom, who did this to you? <laughs> Immediately, and, and instead of telling her the truth that was embarrassing, I would just lie and I would describe the most generic man I could think of. And I'd say Ben. <laughs> ben did it to me, get him. <laughs> and then I'd send her off to go throw a drink in some random man's face. Because if you ever thrown a drink in someone's face, it's incredible, right? Yeah. It's the most fun you can have for under $15. Like, I, I couldn't recommend it more highly. The moment the liquid leaves your hand, you feel free from the shackles of society. You feel like a woman taking charge of your life, a woman taking control in this world. Yes, thank you. The, the, the moment the liquid lands, not as good. <laughs> you gotta get out of there pretty quick. <laughs> Or well, you'll find out, well, everyone thinks you're absolutely feral. Um, that's all from me. I've been through Blake. Thank you.
Um, I recently found out that I'm an optimist. Um, I did not know, I thought I was a pessimist, and then I found out I had a secret optimist trapped inside, like some kind of hope babushka. <laughs> and now I know, I start to see it everywhere. I think all human beings are inherently optimistic as a species. Like if we weren't optimists, why would we have invented so many different ways to make wishes? <laughs> oh. Birthday candles, <laughs> shooting stars, <laughs> eyelashes. <laughs> Wells. <laughs> Wells? Well, only human beings would ruin a perfectly good well by fanging coins in it for wishes. Uh, ding, splash. What did you wish for? Clean drinking water. <laughs> Every time, so parched. And um, now I know I'm an optimist. I'm really taking pleasure in like the small delights in my life, like just little likes. Things that I like, not my loves, my likes. Carrot cake. <laughs> Bunnings. <laughs> Being able to get a USB plug in on the first go. <laughs> it still hasn't happened yet. Uh, obviously it always goes wrong, wrong, right, how? <laughs> but a girl can dream. Um, being able to find my passport. That's more relief than like, but I really like the relief. <laughs> I keep my passport in a terrible place. I keep it in a drawer that I just call the chaos drawer. It's a drawer of my own making. It's just crammed full of things that have absolutely no business cohabiting, but are like a share house of lovable misfits in a rental crisis. <laughs> and I can't put my passport in a safer place because then I cannot find it because I know it lives in the chaos drawer. And I have quite a chaos drawer brain. Um, there's a lot crammed in there. She's got a lot of tabs open, you know? A lot of tabs on the daily. New tab, bats. Are they just leather birds? <laughs> New tab. I think I would enjoy sport a lot more if the commentators took into account the horoscopes of the players. <laughs> you know, if it was just like, yeah, look, Maxi Gorn, he's a powerful forward, but he's also a Capricorn. <laughs> So with uh, Mercury in retrograde today, he's really going to need to be grounded to stand a chance against Collingwood. <laughs> New tab. Sometimes I feel hopeful for humanity and then I see someone feed a chip to a seagull and I think, nah, we deserve everything we get. <laughs> New tab. Sometimes I feel hopeful for humanity and then I stand at an airport baggage carousel and I think, nah, we deserve everything we get. New tab, because one of the only human constants is greed and that must be why we have deal or no deal. New tab, sometimes I think mindfulness is just a buzzword to make you feel bad about having thoughts. But that is something that I thought of while I was being mindful. <laughs> It's a lot going on in there. And um, the feeling of very occasionally being able to like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb my way back to a point that I was trying to make is exactly how it feels to find my passport in the chaos drawer. I was feeling tired, I was feeling lost, I was feeling like I could never seem to bear the cost of everything that I was trying to afford. Bought so many things and I was still bored. Trying to be cool, I was trying to be nice, I was trying to make decisions without ever thinking twice. Just tired, I was feeling lonely, I was feeling down, I was feeling like the only person in the world who didn't have a place. I knew I had my body but I didn't know my face. I didn't know who I was or what I stood for. My beliefs so what I'm good for. Like I couldn't connect, like I couldn't reach out, like I couldn't stand up, like I I didn't feel proud, like I didn't feel right, like I didn't feel wrong I didn't have a home, like I didn't belong, like I wasn't sure who I should be And I couldn't explain that easily, like I didn't know which road was mine But then I ate something and I felt fine <laughs> Will I have an existential crisis every single time that I feel hunger? Or every time I go to the hairdresser and they say, so what do you do? And I look at myself in that mirror and I think, what do you do? Because <laughs> if you ask me who I am, I'll say I'm a comedian, a musician, and I also write, but in the darkest dark of night, I worry and I sometimes cry if I 
stop working, do I die? If I'm not my job, then who am I? Not all the questions are rhetorical. <laughs> Nothing, that's fine. Holidays are just for when you have success at last. And then you take a break for that success. We have to earn our happiness. We have to earn our happiness. Sounds like a solo for capitalism. Maybe that comes down to my family Cause I'm one of five kids And though I'm short, I'm actually the eldest daughter Eldest daughters in the room, let me hear you Yeah! Now let me hear you say Happy birthday, Mum, here's a present from all of us No verse for that one, just wanted to air a grievance. <laughs> Maybe I'm a wider sum of information. Should I define myself by my entire generation? Cause I'm a millennial, straight up Gen Y. You can recognize us by overplucked brows, skinny jeans, not knowing what chuggy means. Or even how to say it, chuggy. Your silence tells me everyone in this room is my age or older, perfect. <laughs> Millennials, we all love brunch because we can't afford both breakfast and lunch. <laughs> Two meals in the day in this economy, the decadence. Actually, one of the biggest generational differences that I could never have been prepared for with younger people is that I didn't know that when I got older, the board game company Hasbro would release a gender parity version of the game Guess Who? Equal men and equal women in Guess Who? What the fuck? Cause how could I explain to someone half my age that when I was young, you never pick a woman in Guess Who? It was a surefire way to lose. Guess who? Cause if you pick Susan, the one woman with white hair, all your opponent had to do was be like, are you a woman? Yes. <laughs> do you have white hair? Yes. Are you Susan? Yes, I'm fucking Susan! <laughs> sure, five paths to losing. I learned early playing games. If you want to succeed in life, be a white guy, just be James. Let's not even get into the fact that early Guess Who's idea of diversity was 19 white people and then five characters who were Italian. <laughs> God, I've been on so many tangents now. I'm not really sure of what this song was about. Not sure. Passport in the chaos draw. Thank you very much. Give it up for Julian Postgres! I'm back, baby! They said it couldn't be done and I proved them wrong. <laughs> I, um, I've, got, I've got a mate, I won't say his name, Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne. Um, all Dwaynes are the same, all Chads are the same, Cooper's the new Chad, they're all the same, right? And, uh, but he's one of those mates, and I'm sure we've all got the same mate, right? He's one of those guys, he loves gambling, but he thinks he can outsmart the casino. <laughs> you know that friend, he's like, mate, I've got a little trick. I've got a little trick on how to outsmart the casino. On how to outsmart the casino. I was like, yeah, if you know how to outsmart the casino, how come at the casino they've got chandeliers and nice carpet and at your house, your wife doesn't let you in? <laughs> Is the trick you lost all your superannuation? Is that the trick? Um, also, I got mine out during COVID and bought a dirt bike. What are the odds? Anyway, it's actually my third one, unnecessary, but whatever. Anyway, uh... Right, but uh, he, he, he took me to a town. He, well, he came over and he took me to a town and he took me to Ballarat. Have you guys been to Ballarat before? Man, I love Ballarat. But Ballarat's website's pretty funny. Right, because Ballarat's website described Ballarat as an eclectic mix of food, art, wine and culture. 
which is an interesting way of saying, we have three McDonald's. <laughs> and most of our wine comes out of a tap, right? Right, but I went to, I was in Ballarat and he loves to gamble, so he took me to a pokey den. I don't like to gamble that much, but he took me to a pokey den and the pokey den in Ballarat had the funniest name. Right, this pokey den was called the Robin Hood Inn. The Robin, I don't think they've seen the movie. I definitely don't think they've read the book, right? Right, but uh, the, the Robin Hood Inn, it's a great pub, but it's a big pokey den. But also the Robin Hood Inn, it caters for everyone, so it's got a big child's playground, a massive child's playground. But how do they, see, this, these are two conflicting ideas. So obviously, the, you know, the Robin Hood Inn want people to come and their kids to play, but they also want the, gamble, you know, the parents to go off and gamble. So how did, how did the Robin Hood Inn solve these two issues? Every gambling machine has an LCD screen of the kid's playground. So you can watch your kids play house while you lose their actual one, you know? I was like, dude, this is depressing. I've got to get the hell out of here, right? And he goes, all right, we'll go to an RSL, right? And RSLs are different in Western Australia, where I'm from. None of them have poker machines, but over here in Victoria, they've all got poker machines. And we went in there and he goes, come on, mate, it's what the diggers would have wanted. I was like, I don't know if it is, you know? Like my great granddad copped a bullet in a world war, right? And when he got shot, fell to the ground and started crawling back to safety over the top of all his fallen comrades, I don't think his dying words were, ah, I hope Dwayne gets a feature. More chilly. Could have been, I wasn't there. <laughs> but guys, you've been an amazing audience. Let's keep that round of applause going. Come on! Thank you enough for Lewis Garner! Hello. Hey, give it up for Brett Blake, everybody. Let him hear it. <laughs> oh, good. How are you all? You well? Yeah, okay, me too. I, um, I had a really awkward interaction last week. I want to tell you about it. I had an embarrassing moment with a stranger. I was in Sydney last week just for one day and I had a bit of time to kill and so I was just wandering around Sydney on my own just doing a bit of Sydney shit. <laughs> Whatever you just imagined just then, that's what I was doing. <laughs> and because I was on my own, I was talking to myself a bit, right? <laughs> nothing bad, nothing weird, just all good, you know, just normal, just... Oh, the bridge is pretty big, you know, just shit like that, whatever. <laughs> Just commenting on things to myself. As the day progressed, I got more chatty with myself. More enthusiastic, probably raised the volume a bit. I'm heading back to my accommodation. I got a chicken wrap on my way back. I was very excited. And now I'm walking with a bit more gusto because I'm keen to get back and eat that chicken wrap. I come around the corner and I nearly crashed into someone. You know when you come around the corner of the footpath and you both pull up, you're like, whoop, like that? Whenever you do that, just after that, there's a moment where you just stare into each other's eyes. You're right in each other's space. But just before that, just as I'd rounded that bend, my brain had decided to say something to myself. I didn't want to say it anymore, but it was too late. I couldn't catch it. The message had already been sent to my vocal cord. So I've just stared this woman directly in the eyes and pretty much yelled, fuck yeah, chicken wrap. <laughs> that happened last week. Somewhere in Sydney right now, she's telling her version of that story. And I don't reckon I come off that well in that version. But I'm, I'm always doing shit like that. I'm always having embarrassing moments. I had a shocker recently. I think this is one of the most embarrassing things you can do as an adult. I called someone mum who wasn't my mum. It was so bad. It was worse as well because I did it at work. Not this job, I should specify. I've got a day job. That'd be weird if I was like, mum... Hello. Nah, during the day I work at a school as a teacher's aide. I'm a teacher's aide at a school and I love that job. I work at a school, it's like, yeah, fuck yeah, thank you. All right, cool, that's nice. A few members of the Australian Education Union in tonight. Rock on. The school I work at is primary and secondary. I work with kids of all different ages and it's good in tandem with this job. They work well as a pair because um, kids say heaps of funny shit. It does feel a bit unethical sometimes. 
when you're sitting in class, they divulge something to you and your first thought is, that's getting repeated tonight. <laughs> Sorry, mate. They say too many funny things. Primary school age kids, best thing about them is their lack of filter. They haven't learnt social etiquette yet, so they just speak. If you get offended, bad luck. <laughs> Pure honesty, it's the best. I was talking to a girl at the school recently. She's eight years old. She was trying to ask me how old I am. I could tell that was what she wanted to ask, but she couldn't figure out how to phrase the sentence. She was getting all jumbled. She was like, how many ages are the years of your birth? <laughs> At what month is the number of your years? <laughs> and then eventually she just went, when are you going to die? <laughs> Pure honesty. That's what we're all really asking when we ask that. But lately I've been working more with the high school students. I've been in the high school. Completely different job. I'm a teacher's aide, so I help out in the classroom. In the primary school there's a million things to do. You're jumping around constantly. High school, obviously, is a very different job as a teacher's aide. On my first day, I was a bit confused as to what my job kind of was. I went in, I look at my roster, I'm supporting a kid in year 10 science. So I go in, I meet him. He's in a wheelchair, but intellectually he's very capable. We sit down, the teacher, she's over there, she starts giving the science lesson. Pretty quickly realise he's better at year 10 science than me. <laughs> now I'm just kind of like, what's my job at this point? <laughs> what am I doing? Like, what am I doing? Like, she's there, she's giving the lesson. I'm here, she's giving the lesson. I'm just doing year 10 science, aren't I? <laughs> and loving it, if I'm honest. I was like, this was too hard for me when I was in year 10, but this is about my level now. Can I answer some of these? <laughs> he said, that's igneous. I reckon it's sedimentary, that one. <laughs> it does feel like that often. I was in a maths class the other day, year eight maths. The, the kid that I'm working with is like, what's the angle of that triangle? How do we figure that out? I just had to go, I reckon we asked the teacher. <laughs> teacher comes over and like, squats down and explains it, but doing it to me. <laughs> that's my colleague, do you know what I mean? We're meant to be equals. I have to be in the staff room with him 20 minutes later, acting like we're on the same wavelength. What are you up to this weekend? Hey, thanks for that Pythagoras shit, by the way. Legend. I went on a camp last year with a year 10 class, and before the camp started, the teachers, they sent an email to the parents of all the kids with a list of all the things the kids needed to bring with them on camp, but they didn't send me the list. I guess it's assumed like I'm an adult, maybe I don't need the list but I could have used that list. <laughs> I forgot a lot of important shit. I didn't bring any cutlery to eat my dinner with. I didn't have a fork and I was too embarrassed to ask one of the teachers if I could borrow their fork. So I asked a kid. <laughs> <laughs> kind of weird, I just picked a kid that I thought had a mature vibe. I was like, hey, can I borrow your fork? And he was so cool about it. He's like, yeah, no worries. I'll eat first, I'll wash it and I'll give it to you. If I can't see, I'll leave it on that table for you. Then you can eat, just wash it and give it back to me or leave it on the table. And for the next four nights, <laughs> I just used a 15 year old's fork. <laughs> Do you know how pathetic that is? They're all eating dinner, I'm watching to see when he's done. Make my way over, hey bro, can I get a look at that fork again? On the fourth night, as he was handing the fork to me, as he gave it to me, he's like, you're not gonna make this mistake again, are you? <laughs> Who's the grown up in this scenario? <laughs> And then on the last day of the camp, I woke up, there was a tap at my tent in the morning and it was that kid and he's so polite. He's like, is this an okay time, Lewis? Is this an okay time? And I was blowing away the vape smoke in my tent. Like, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> I opened the tent and I stuck my head out. I said, what's going on? He said, I can't find the fork. Do you know where it is? I checked, it wasn't on the table. I swear I left it on the table. I couldn't see it. It wasn't on the other table. It wasn't around the I've lost this kid's fork. <laughs> I apologised to him, he was fine about it. But that night, it's like the final dinner of the camp. It's the last night. We're all having dinner in a big circle around the fire. And he yells out to his friend, he goes, hey, can I borrow your fork? But this camp, it's all about like responsibility and shit, you know? It's all about teaching the kid, be responsible, like don't lose things, all that sort of stuff. So the teacher, she hears him say that and she's like, what? Where's your fork? Why don't you have a fork? And he points at me <laughs> from across the fire and he goes, I let him borrow it and he lost it. <laughs> she turns to see who he's pointing at. I can tell by the swivel of her head, she thinks she's gonna land on a kid. 
Do you know what I mean? She's ready to tell off a student. She lands on me, she's like, oh, that's awkward. How do I tell him off? And everyone goes quiet. All the kids, they all just stop talking. They stop eating immediately. They're all just sitting there watching, like, what's going to happen here? And I felt so embarrassed. I had no control over this. I felt like my inner child just emerged out of nowhere. I looked at this woman. She's about 30 years older than me. And three words came out of my mouth. I didn't want to say this. I just looked at her and said, fuck, sorry, (laughs) mum. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Enjoy the rest of your night. Good evening, my name is Rob Orton. Uh, give me a cheer if you've ever seen me before. I don't believe you. All right, well, the rest of you, you've seen me now. So I'll go off and I'll introduce myself again. And you might be a bit more familiar with my work. Okay. Comedy up late. It's time for your next act. I'm sure you've all seen him before. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Roberto! My name's Rob Orton. Give me a cheer if you've ever seen me before. That's what it must feel like. It makes you feel alive. Performing. I know I'm alive. I know I'm alive due to the fact that self-service checkouts in supermarkets ask me the question, Do you wish to continue? (laughs) What? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Of course I wish to continue. I'm in a supermarket. That's where you go. If you wish to continue. If I didn't wish to continue, I wouldn't be in a supermarket, would I? I'd be at home. Discontinuing myself off. I'm not in a supermarket at the moment. I'm here, doing a live performance. I once saw an interview with Kylie Minogue and she was talking about the art of live performance. According to Kylie Minogue, all you have to do in any live performance situation, the key is you have to make every single person in that room, you've just got to make them feel like they've been seen and you've looked at them, and that is it. That is the key to live performance. I've never been to a Carly Minogue concert before, <laughs> but I imagine they are exactly like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all right when she's doing her gigs in rooms this size. It doesn't take that long to make everyone feel like they've been seen. What about when she's doing her massive gigs in the stadium? She must be there for absolutely ages, just like that. (laughs) Just going along the roads like that. I'm looking around, getting to my highlight. I want to make you feel like you've been seen. There's a lot of people here tonight. There's a lot of people that aren't here as well. Out there. I got the plane here, got a foot Melbourne. Some people were getting planes away from Melbourne. I was like, I guess you're not coming. Thanks for the support. A lot of people here used to be children. I was doing this the other night and pretty much after every line I said, there was a lady in the audience who said, what? 
There is a lot of people there, a lot of people who used to be children. I've been thinking, if I ever have a little boy, what I'm going to call him, I've come to the conclusion, if I have a son, his name will be Dad. <laughs> After my dad. <laughs> and his dad. At the hospital, I will introduce Dad to my mum. <laughs> hey, look. Mum. Got someone to show you. This is Dad. <laughs> Your grandson, don't cry, Dad. You know, I used to be a bit more upbeat than this, you know. I used to think CCTV was a very, very positive Spanish television channel. <laughs> but it's not. If you are looking at me thinking, hmm, not sure about this guy, look, I've had some reviews for the shows I've been doing. I got one review and it said, Rob Orton adopts the persona of an underprepared best man. <laughs> I got another one. Said, some of the worst mic craft I've ever seen. I was like, no, you are. It's meant to be like this, you know. You've got to use it quite sparingly to get the mic And I got another one, and it said, like watching a child caught in the stage lights of his first nativity. I'd say that as a compliment, right? Because I do want to try and keep this fresh and new for myself and try and stay excited about being on stage. I love being on stage. Being on stage is one of the few places where worry, anxiety and paranoia just seems to vanish. It loses its grip on me. When I've got old people looking at me. It's as if my brain's saying, yeah, we've got something real to worry about now, Rob. <laughs> I like a lot of things in this world. I like the sky. Where does the sky start? Does the sky start where the ground stops? What's this bit? Right. What? I like faces, I like faces so much. I got one. What? I got one on the front of my head. I'd like to introduce you to my face. Look at all the faces in here. It's like a face showroom in here. Isn't it? I was once doing a gig in a place in uh, England called Reading. No! I said that, I, I said, I like faces, I like faces so much, I got one. There was a guy on the front row, turned to the person next to him, said something, I heard what he said, he said, I wish we'd bought more drugs. <laughs> I like water, water! What is it good for? Absolutely loads of stuff! What is water? Water is the smell of a pint of orange cordial before you've added the cordial. <laughs> Similar in taste to the broken pelvis of a melted snowman. Water, arch enemy of the Dyson Airblade. Give me a cheer if you got a hairdryer in your house. Give me a cheer if you got a hand dryer in your house. No, no, it's, it's not illegal, is it? We just all agreed not to. <laughs> Give me a cheer if you've got a hot water bottle in your house. I once met a lady who had two hot water bottles, one for the bedroom and one for the living room. What a luxury. Doesn't she know they are portable? <laughs> I've got quite long hair and a beard at the moment. It's getting to the stage like, dogs look at me differently when I, when I look like this. I saw a dog, right? The dog was side on. The dog was side on like this. I was coming down like this and the dog went like this. It did a double take. I've never seen a dog do a double take before. They look up at me like that. I'll just stand up like that. What breed are you? Right, that's it. I said. All the way from New Zealand to Holland. Yeah. Melbourne, how you doing? I am Joseph. This is Laura. We are two hearts from Auckland, New Zealand. It's been four years since we performed live in Melbourne. And I suppose you want a little update on how our lives are going? Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, in December, Laura and I actually became married. Thank you, thank you. Um, but don't worry, that doesn't mean we've become one of those boring married couples. You know, this just simply means that Joseph and I are now taking our offstage relationship a little bit more seriously. <laughs> For example, when I have a threesome, I now invite Joseph. <laughs> I always say no, but it's nice to be asked. <laughs> 
Uh, fun fact. Fun fact. We have actually been a duo longer than we have been a couple. So what you are looking at is a bona fide workplace relationship. Yeah. Joseph fucked his boss. <laughs> it's more of a kind of 50-50 co-shareholder scenario. But, no, know. I had to report him to HR. And then he fucked HR. <laughs> I'm also HR. <laughs> we did try to keep things strictly professional and platonic for as long as possible. Yeah, but then we got drunk at the Two Hearts Christmas party and there wasn't any other options. <laughs> We're not allowed back at Holy Moly. <laughs> but we are allowed back in, in Melbourne City and it's so good to be here. And Laura, do you know what time it is? Oh, I don't know, Joseph. Is it bad bitch o'clock? No. No, oh. it's, it's not a real time. <laughs> Well, then it must be Thick 30. Look, you know it's not Thick 30 because you had an osteo appointment earlier today at Thick 45. Oh, is it called it a sleigh? No. Laura, you know what time it is. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry, Joseph. I'm still on New Zealand time. How could I forget? It's... Wine o'clock. <laughs> yeah, make some noise if you like drinking a lovely wine. Oh, love a cheeky vino. We love a cheeky vino. Laura, why don't you tell them what your favourite type of wine is? Both. <laughs> there are two colours. <laughs> As you can tell, we know our wine. Red and white. Thank you, Laura. And you can get it in glass or cardboard. <laughs> Let's not alienate some of the non-wine drinkers in the room with our extensive knowledge, Laura. Oh, I'm so sorry. You see, Joseph and I, we recently went on a, a wine tour in the south of France, and we bought some wine with some pretty interesting notes. Yeah, they don't need to hear this. The notes were euros. I think it's safe to say that we are a couple of wine aficionados, which is why we have actually written a song for all of the wine connoisseurs. And Connor Dames. Use inclusive language, Joseph. I'm listening, I'm learning. <laughs> Hit the track. Picture, if you will, a vineyard setting. Because that's where the song is set. Yo, I was at a vineyard on a pleasant day. Sipping on Pinot Noir and Cabernet. When I walked up to the vintner and I said, Okie dokie, do you have a shot of
pasta, then I eat some bolognese And I eat the shit pasta, then I eat some bechamel I eat the shit pasta, then I eat some bolognese And I eat the shit pasta, then I eat some bechamel I eat the shit pasta, Melvin. I say drink. Drink responsibly. Now specifically looking at Laura, drink responsibly. Thank you. Let me do hearts. We'll catch you later.